everyone, I'm Katie and welcome to my channel, Biology by Katie. In the first series of videos, I'm going to be going through the AQA A-Level Biology specification topic by topic. I really hope you find these videos useful, interesting and easy to follow. If you do have any requests or recommendations for me, please just leave me a comment. On to topic 1.2 titled Carbohydrates. In the last video about monomers and polymers, we identified carbohydrates as one of the four organic polymers that make up the entire biochemical basis of life. In case you haven't seen the topic 1.1 video, carbohydrates are large polymer molecules that are made up of repeating single units known as monomers. The specific name for monomers of carbohydrates is monosaccharides. This term translates from Greek to mean single sugar. We have three monosaccharides that we must be aware of within the A-level syllabus. Glucose, this one you will be familiar with from GCSE. And then we have galactose and fructose. These will probably be new terms. I've put the ring structure of each of the monosaccharides up, but just be aware you only need to learn the exact structure of glucose. What's important that we do know, however, is that these three monosaccharides are isomers. The definition of an isomer is where two or more compounds have the same molecular formula, but the arrangement of the atoms is different. The molecular formula of all three of these monosaccharides is C6H12O6. So this means that they have six carbons, 12 hydrogens and six oxygens each. However, they are not the same. Let's look at the structural formula for each sugar. So we can see from the structural formulas that each of the monosaccharides have the six carbon backbone, making all three of them hexose sugars. Now, as you examine the structures, you can see differences between all three. Glucose and galactose are very similar. There is just that one difference at C4. These two are stereoisomers of each other. So this means not only do they have the same atoms, they have the same arrangement too. They just differ from each other in three-dimensional space. You can see there that the C4, or the fourth carbon of both glucose and galactose, has the exact same bonds. A carbon on either side, a hydroxyl group, and a single hydrogen atom. Fructose is slightly different and is a structural isomer of both glucose and galactose, meaning that it does have the same atoms overall, so the same molecular formula, but they are arranged quite differently. So we can see the structural differences, especially there at C1 and C2. Now, as I mentioned before, we do need to know and to memorize the structure of the monosaccharide glucose, and that is because it has two isomers itself. So it has the alpha glucose form and the beta glucose form. The difference between the two is very discreet. There is just a slight difference in the arrangement of atoms at C1. So you can see on the left there, alpha glucose has the H atom at the top and the hydroxyl group at the bottom, whereas the beta glucose has the hydroxyl group at the top and the hydrogen atom at the bottom. So this is the only difference between the alpha and beta glucose molecules, but it does make a big difference when it comes to bonding and how they form polymers. Because we only need to know the structure of glucose off by heart. I am going to do the disaccharide worked example using the glucose structure, but for the other two, galactose and fructose, I'm just going to use the hexagonal representation. We've looked in detail now at the three monosaccharides that we study at A level. What we're going to look at now is the molecules that they become when they join together. So we're going to start off by joining just two monosaccharides together and we will in turn produce a disaccharide. So again, we've got the Greek translation of the word. Saccharides is sugar and di means two. So the word literally translates to two sugars. Here I have two alpha glucose molecules. Now, whether or not you watched the last video, it's important to remember that when we build polymers from monomers, so when we start building longer chained molecules, it occurs by condensation reaction. So what that means is per new bond formed, we have the release of a single water or H2O molecule. So you can see here, we are removing two hydrogens and one oxygen atom. So in total, we have removed a single molecule of water. A new bond is then formed where the water molecule has been removed, so around that remaining oxygen atom. And in terms of monosaccharide bonding, this will be a glycosidic bond. And when we join two glucose molecules together, we have maltose. 
So that's the name of this specific disaccharide molecule. Next, we're going to move on to look at the formation of the two other disaccharides that we look at in the A-level syllabus. But as I said, I'm just using the hexagonal representation of the monosaccharides now. So glucose plus glucose, which is the one we've just worked through, is maltose. That's our end disaccharide unit. Then if we have glucose plus galactose, we end up with the disaccharide lactose. You might be familiar with this one. It's common in milk. A lot of people are intolerant to lactose. And finally, we have the combination of glucose and fructose, which produces the disaccharide sucrose. So they're the three disaccharides that we need to be familiar with. We need to know which two monosaccharides are joined together to produce those three disaccharides. As we combine more than two monosaccharides, we are beginning to build a polysaccharide. Now, the word poly in Greek means many or multiple. And again, saccharides is the Greek term for sugar. So here we are literally translating to many or multiple sugars. The first polysaccharide that we're going to look at is starch. So starch is a glucose storage molecule that is found inside plant cells and plant cells only. The specific monosaccharide of starch is alpha glucose molecules. So it's made up of alpha glucose molecules repeating one after another. So they go through the condensation process to produce disaccharide maltose. And then we continue on with a chain of condensation reactions to keep adding more and more alpha glucose to the chain until we have our polysaccharide. Starch has two different structural forms, amylose and amylopectin. The one that you can see here is amylose. It is a linear molecule and consists of 1,4 linkages only. So the monosaccharides are arranged in this uniform straight line. Now the 1,4 linkages mean that the glycosidic bond is formed between C1 of one glucose and C4 of the other. The second variation of starch is amylopectin, so that's this one here. Amylopectin still has the same linear base as amylose, but we also have some branching as well. The branching is the result of 1,6 linkages. So you can see there that a secondary chain is bonded to the primary chain at C6. A condensation reaction occurs here as well, and a glycosidic bond is formed. Amylopectin typically has repetitive branching per 20 glucose molecules. So after our two starch structures, the next polysaccharide that we are going to look at is glycogen. Glycogen is often referred to as animal starch due to its similarity in structure to amylopectin. Only glycogen is found exclusively in animal and fungi cells, so it's never found in plant cells. It is the glucose storage molecule of these organisms um, that has almost the exact same properties as starch, only it's generally larger. Glycogen is formed again from alpha glucose units, joining to form maltose, so the same um, process so far as starch, and then the final branched polysaccharide. Glycogen is slightly more highly branched than amylopectin, so it has repetitive branching every 10 glucose molecules. Again, 1,4 linkages on the baseline and 1,6 linkages to form the branching. Let's look at the properties of these large carbohydrates. So due to their structural similarities, it will not be surprising that they do behave in a very similar manner within cells. Firstly, both starch and glycogen are very compact. They can store a lot of glucose molecules in a small space, which is what makes them such great storage molecules. Secondly, they are both large insoluble molecules. One, this means that neither glycogen nor starch can diffuse out of the cells without being hydrolyzed, as they are too large to pass through the plasma membrane. And two, they have no osmotic effect on the cell in which they reside. This is essential as we don't want water to be drawn into the cell and cause damage. Amylopectin and glycogen are both branched polysaccharides. This means that there are a lot of terminal glucose molecules exposed, ready to be acted on by hydrolytic enzymes. Therefore, glucose can be easily released and transported quickly if and when it is needed for respiration. The final polysaccharide that we are going to look at is cellulose. I've added this one in separately as it is quite a bit different to both starch and glycogen. 
The first difference is that the monosaccharide unit from which cellulose is built is beta glucose, not alpha like the other two. Now, I mentioned before that the beta isomer only differs in its 3D arrangement at C1, but that does make all the difference for cellulose. So let's start by looking at this alpha glucose molecule. Due to its structure, both of the hydroxyl groups, the one on C1 and C4, will always be facing in the same direction. Now this is essential for the formation of the 1,4 glycosidic bond. Add another alpha glucose next to it and the hydroxyl groups are both facing down and we can make a nice glycosidic bond between the two. So beta glucose has that slight structural difference, hydroxyl facing up at C1 but down at C4. So this means that when we do try and come to join two beta glucose together, neither side has the two hydroxyl groups together that are required. Thus, no bond. The solution to this problem is the inverted beta glucose. So this is a beta glucose molecule that has been flipped 180 degrees. So as you can now see, the two hydroxyl groups, one on C1 of the normal beta glucose and one on C4 of the inverted beta glucose are both facing up. So the bond can be formed. If we then add a third beta glucose, this time an original one, as it must be alternating, the hydroxyl groups are both facing downwards. So the inversion of beta glucose, every other molecule allows those 1,4 linkages to still be formed and we have alternating glycosidic bonds. If we keep adding beta glucose units, we end up with this polysaccharide cellulose that has those alternating glycosidic bonds. This bonding structure is unique and it allows parallel strands of cellulose to form strong hydrogen bonds between each strand. Let's now talk about some properties of the beta glucose polysaccharide cellulose. Firstly, thanks to its unique bonding, it is extremely valuable structural molecule. In fact, it is the main structural component in plant cell walls, which you may or may not know are designed to be strong and rigid. Next up, we have strength. Again, due to the alternation of inverted and normal beta glucose units, the glycosidic bonds form in a unique pattern despite sticking to the 1,4 linkage rule. This means that the shape of the linear chains is slightly different and allows hydrogen bonding to form between parallel strands. Whilst hydrogen bonds are themselves weak, they do build up a huge accumulative strength and this is what will happen when we are building cellulose. Finally, fibrils. The beta glucose formation of cellulose means that once the parallel strands have formed and they have formed strong hydrogen bonds between one another, the strands then group together into microfibrils and eventually fibrils. All of this adds to the collective strength of cellulose. Okay, well, that concludes the content for today's topic on carbohydrates. So let's go through the content points of the AQA specification for topic 1.2 and check that we have covered everything. First point, monosaccharides are the monomers from which larger carbohydrates are made. So all three of the carbohydrates that we've looked at today have been made from either alpha or beta glucose, which we know is one of our monosaccharides. Glucose, galactose and fructose are common monosaccharides. So we looked at our three monosaccharides. We discussed the fact that they were structural or stereoisomers of one another because they all had the same molecular formula. And a condensation reaction between two monosaccharides forms a glycosidic bond. So remember, the condensation reaction was the removal of a single water molecule per new bond. And the specific bond that does form between monosaccharides is that glycosidic bond. Disaccharides are formed by the condensation of two monosaccharides. So di meaning two, saccharides meaning sugar, yes. Maltose was the disaccharide formed by condensation of two glucose. So remember we did that worked example, glucose had glucose was maltose. Sucrose was formed by the condensation of glucose and fructose. And then finally, we will have lactose is formed by glucose, the combination of glucose and galactose. Glucose itself has two isomers, alpha and beta glucose. So we looked at the two structures of both alpha and glucose and we had that slight difference 
of the bonding structure at carbon one. Polysaccharides are formed by the condensation of many glucose units. So poly we had translating to many or multiple and therefore we must have many or multiple glucose units. Next, we looked at glycogen and starch, so they were very structurally similar to each other. They were both formed from long chains of alpha glucose molecules. Then we looked at cellulose and how it was quite structurally different from the other two due to the fact that it was formed from beta glucose molecules. So we had that inversion of beta glucose and alternating glycosidic bonds formed. And finally, we looked at the basic functions of all three of our carbohydrates and how they behaved within their organisms. So there we have it, topic 1.2 complete. Thank you for listening and I hope you have found this video useful.